Thank you very much, uh, Sergio and uh, uh, Cameron and Jim, for, for this invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, today, um, I will not talk about nuclear receptors at all. Uh, maybe you have seen uh, some of the posters uh, here. Uh, today, I, I want to, to talk a little bit about enzymes sacrification of biomass to produce ethanol. As you know, um, Brazil has for many years, for 30-something years, uh, producing ethanol from sugarcane. Half of our cars run on ethanol that is produced in uh, juices, direct fermentation of sucrose. And actually, very easy. It looks like a, no, uh, a 19th century uh, brewery with uh, you know, uh, fermenting sugar cane. And it's economically very viable, though, because it's friendly uh, to the environment. And ethanol is actually very cheap. It's not cheap right now because the sugar price in the international market is very high. However, uh, two thirds of the mass that you extract from the from the biomass is actually um, kind of lost. I mean, you don't. Two thirds of the mass is made of the uh, the sugarcane bagasse uh, and the uh, leaves, and that is used today currently in the mills as energy source for the mills. They actually burn the bagasse and uh, produce uh, energy for the mills. And that is not a very, um, um, no, you can do better uh, in terms of uh, A cartoon uh, where you have this uh, lignocellulosic material. You uh, if you submitted this to a pretreatment. It can be thermochemical. It can be chemical. It can be actually also enzymatic. And you actually expose. You remove hemicellulose and lignin that you can actually use for other uh, chemicals. Uh, but you actually expose the cellulose uh, matrix, and you can come in here with. Uh, uh, um, a cocktail of enzymes, uh, and then this will uh, crack down the um, the, um, the the crystalline uh, cellulose matrix, and then you have uh, endoglucanase that will eat up here in the middle. You have uh, cello biohydrolases that will uh, cut uh, on the edges, and this will produce smaller sugars, and the smaller sugars will actually be captured by beta glycosidases and then will this be transformed into fermentable sugar. And with this, you hope to produce or increase at least by some 40% production. So this is a, a dream that not only Brazil is pursuing, but uh, everybody else uh, in the world that can produce some crops, uh, corn or uh, wood uh, is trying to pursue um, uh, this, right? So uh, this is uh, somebody else's cartoon that I put on the internet, which I don't can't uh, track the uh, the the, um, the author at this moment. But the the idea is that you have this uh, cellulose matrix, and there are enzymes here that binds to cellulose. And there's a, a, a module here that binds the cellulose, and then there is a module that actually uh, hydrolyzes uh, the bonds. And, and and this is one of the ideas. And how how can you devise proteins that will do this efficiently? Enzymes has to be thermostable, and uh, be to, you have to be able to recover it at the end. Okay, so. Along these lines, we have started actually uh, started doing some of this uh, some work on this. And the, the first work that we actually did uh, was uh, on uh, a thermostable uh, uh, laminarinase, which is does something else, but it's not actually for cellulose degradation. 
but it's a very interesting uh, protein. It's a, it's a hyperchamber stable. It has an optimal, optimal, optimal temperature of 88 degrees Celsius. Um, and it's also hyperthermophilic. Uh, it has its enzymatic activity uh, at uh, very high uh, temperatures. And we want to understand how this enzyme is able to sustain optimal uh, catalytic activity under uh, such a uh, harsh uh, conditions. The first thing, that, this is the structure that was actually solved. Uh, the structure is not moving, but it's, uh, it's a, okay, it's a, okay, doesn't want to move. But anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice structure. It was resolved uh, by a, a friend of ours, uh, Igor Polikarpov, which uh, a protein crystallographer at uh, San Carlo less than two angstroms uh, resolution. And this structure is, is composed by uh, uh, two sets of uh, beta sheets like this. And the catalytic activity or the catalytic uh, sites is right here. Okay, so it's like that. And in the, in between the two sets of sheets here, it's uh, it's the hydrophobic core of the protein. So we want to understand how this enzyme is able to maintain its uh, structure at high temperature and also at um, its uh, catalytic activity um, at also at high temperature. So. One way to approach is uh, to approach this problem is to get other proteins that are structurally homologous, very similar, but they have different thermophilicity and thermostability. So we took two proteins uh, from I can't pronounce this name, so they my Latin language, but I can't narcotrop. It's a thermophile. And, um, and, and and this one here is a mesophile. And they have very similar structures. This, the, 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 the three proteins, this is the uh, Arudothermos marinos laminarines. Uh, they are superimposed here. You see they are very, very similar. And we start looking at this structure to understand how one is a mesophile, the other one is a thermophile, and the other one is a hyperthermophile. And the first thing that we, when you look at the structure, you see, well, let's look at salt bridges. And we see that the salt bridge, uh, the uh, Rhodothermos marinos, has a, a high number of uh, salt bridges. However, just looking at the salt bridges is not enough, because salt bridges are hydrophilic interactions. So how this protein can maintain its, uh, its uh, structure in water? So just increasing the number of salt bridges is not enough. So we started to looking at the topological distribution of salt bridges, where they occur. And we look at these, uh, the three enzymes. And one thing that we notice is that we say, well, let's see a salt bridge between a pair of uh, residues. So there are many pairs. A salt bridge that it's not just a single salt bridge, but is there's one one residue here makes a salt bridge there and makes another salt bridge there. So we call this cluster. This is a, so a three residue cluster. So there are two of those. Then a five member salt bridge cluster. There are five of them. Uh, six member salt bridge. So these are all connected salt bridges. Okay. And when you look at the thermophile and the mesophile, that doesn't happen connectivity is much smaller. And with one very important difference, this mesophile here has salt bridges that are formed between the outer uh, set of beta sheets and the inner set of beta sheets. So they have salt bridges right uh, across the hydrophobic core of this enzyme. And that tells us something. That tells us that the hydrophobic core of this enzyme is quote unquote contaminated by hydrophilic contacts. Okay? So that makes the first step. So we started to examine is this has this has any consequences. And the first thing that we notice is that we performed simulations under two 
different temperatures, uh, room temperature and uh, a higher temperature. And one thing that we noticed is that water starts penetrating the hydrophobic core of the protein of the mesophile protein, but does not penetrate the, the hydrophobic core of the hyperthermophile. And the reason water penetrates the mesophile hydrophobic core is because the hydrophobic core of that mesophile is contaminated by a salt bridge. So water goes right in there and starts disrupting the um, hydrophobic core of this protein. And actually, data is not shown here, but they actually performed uh, denaturation uh, simulations uh, on this. And this is the beginning of the uh, um, of this uh, rupture of this uh, structure. So this is the beginning of the ending of civilization for catalytic activity. Okay. So, what about thermophilicity? Why is this enzyme uh, so much, uh, this hyperthermophilic, so similar structurally, structurally to these ones, why is it able to maintain its high um, catalytic activity, whereas this one here cannot at higher temperature? And when we start looking at the opening of the catalytic cleft, we notice that the catalytic cleft would span three types of, of uh, conformations. One is an open conformation where the catalytic cleft is like this. One is a tube-like conformation where the is like this. It looks but still there is a, a void in here. And a third type of um, of conformation where the side chains here would collapse, not collapse, but would actually close and actually obstruct the catalytic cleft. So these are shown here, the relative amounts. Um, this is uh, obstructed, uh, tube-like, and open. And you see that for the hyperthermophilic, um, open or tube-like is actually uh, maintained or, or sustained even at higher temperature. However, for the mesophile, at higher temperature, the, the, the fraction of open uh, conformations, the, one, the, the conformation that would allow the substrate to bind, uh, decreases considerably from this point to this one, and it actually the cavity closed. So what you see here is this is the main conformation of a mesophile, whereas these are for the thermophile and uh, the hyperthermophile. So this sort of qualitatively explains uh, why 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 this uh, enzyme here is able to maintain its activity because it it remains it, it leaves the uh, the catalytic cleft accessible to the um, uh, to the substrate even at higher temperature, whereas uh, this one here is not able to do this. At higher temperature, the uh, side chains close the catalytic cleft. Okay. So this was uh, uh, our the first study that uh, we did. So we actually want to go to other enzymes. Right. And uh, one of the enzymes that we want to study is uh, cell biohydrolase. And this is, I think, this is a cartoon that we actually built uh, out of uh, uh, Mike Himmels from uh, NRL's uh, pictures. We, we copy and paste uh, his pictures and put them uh, together. So this is a, a cartoon that uh, most people believe that it happened, but uh, how it happened. So, so the steps of the catalytic process is like this. You have the substrate here, uh, crystalline cellulose, and then uh, this enzyme has a two domain. It's a catalytic binding module, and uh, uh, the 
the uh, substrate binding module and uh, the catalytic domain, and 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 and, and, and they are both connected to it by a hinge. And the way people believe this happens that it will bind here, and a chain would be lifted up, would be picked up from from this, and then the catalytic domain here would actually uh, um, slide the chain inside and cleave it and this thing would walk on this uh, uh, substrate here. The, how this is actually done or if does this actually happen um, is still a matter of uh, intense um, studies. Okay, So there are studies showing that this one like uh, walk uh, on the substrate happens but still uh, Pretty much unknown. We took one uh, cellular biohydrolase TBH1 from uh, Trichoderma harzianum, actually, uh, eager polycarp of uh, this enzyme and resolved it. It's very similar from uh, to uh, Trichoderma rhizii. And uh, we want to compare these two, but this one here has a higher, uh, better catalytic efficiency. And we wanted to compare these two. So again, we did a comparative study. We took this new structure compared to the old structure available in the literature. And we start looking at the main differences between these two. And one thing that we notice is that uh, the accessible, the, the cleft that is accessible to to the um, um, to the substrate, um, span different conformations as well. It may open and opens and closes differently at different rates. Uh, however, uh, once we examined in details how this happens, what are these open and closed states, we see that in the Trichoderma harzianum. There is a very important difference between the Trichoderma harzianum and the Trichoderma rhizii. And the main difference is that in this position here, 371, uh, there is a tyrosine in Trichoderma rhizii, whereas in uh, uh, Trichoderma harzianum, there is a lanolin with no side chain. So the main, the main idea or the main thing that we notice is that even when this loop here is uh, departed from the um, from the crystal structure this binding cleft is still closed where as opposed to this one which has this uh, open uh, structure so in Trichoderma harzianum there should be an improved substrate accessibility that would lead to Efficiency. This actually uh, is observed experiment, but again, it's more qualitatively, um, uh, uh, qualitative uh, insight. Okay. So, the next uh, study that we want to do is to investigate. One very important aspect of this, and the idea is that the product of this catalysis, uh, a unit of cellobios, actually inhibits enzymatic activity. This is known, experimentally known. If, if, if you know the reasons why this happens, you might devise an enzyme that has, uh, is less uh, prone to uh, product uh, inhibition. So this is the question that we want to investigate. And we took this uh, enzyme and we started looking at it. And we look at the crystallographic structure, you see an open cellobios binding site. You see, this would be the cellobios, the, the catalytic, uh, uh, the cleavage would be right here. And this thing here is, this is open, right? So you thought, well, this, after, uh, you know, a certain amount of time, the uh, cellobios would leave, and there's no reason to uh, inhibit uh, the product to, to inhibit the reaction. Um, 
when we perform the simulations, you could see clearly that the uh, loops in that region are not actually open, but they are flipping. And when they flip, they trap uh, cellulobios. And there are, there are specific uh, uh, interactions between these pair of residues that actually traps uh, cellulobios. See, you see the open and closed conformations of this uh, loop. And uh, what you see is that this tyrosine undergoes a conformation of change, and then the, the product would leave. However, it, it's, it remains closed very much. So what, if, you, if, you, if you try to mutate this, uh, you would get, you would get um, an enzyme which uh, um, is less prone to product uh, inhibition. So we, we did the following. So let's see how what happens. Let's take a, a set of open conformations and try to remove uh, cellulobios from there using steel molecular dynamics. Uh, let's get a set of closed conformations and repeat this experiment and look what the barrier. And what we see is that when it could not be any different. When you have closed conformations, you have extra barriers, so that cost extra amount of work. Um, okay, so we'll just go back a bit. Um, so we are kind of ready to write this paper out or try to do this mutation here, and um, we couldn't compete with NRL, so they published this like. Uh, Two weeks after we observed this, they published a very nice work uh, reporting very similar results where they actually went there and mutated all this uh, in that region, mutated several residues around that region, and actually they found that this tyrosine 381 is very important for um, product uh, inhibition. But, um, so the knowledge is out there then. At any rate. Okay. Uh, run a little bit uh, faster because I'm always dragged behind. One idea that we want to investigate is it's known that uh, this, uh, this typical model here, you have a, a catalytic core domain, you have a cellulose binding uh, module. And people believe that cellulose binding module binds the cellulose, but they know that it binds cellulose. However, there are there is a class of endoglucanases, the ones that bites in the middle of the, especially attacks um, 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 non-crystalline uh, portions of the cellulose that lacks a CBM. They still have activity, binds there, and it has no CBM. And uh, one of these um, is uh, this uh, endoglucanase uh, 3, uh, also from Trichoderma harzianum that uh, Igor Polycarpov um, uh, extracted and, uh, and, and purified and obtained this structure. And we want to understand how come this enzyme is able to bind the substrate without a cellulose binding module. So it's a very simple question. We start looking at the proteins and just examining the structure. So this is a typical cellulobiohydrolase binding module. Have a series of uh, of um, aromatic residues on a flat, forming a flat surface, and this binds binds to the uh, cellulose. Uh, this one here doesn't have this. However, it does have a set of residues that plays the role of this one here. So we actually took this uh, enzyme, docked with, docked with, um, with uh, substrate, and performed simulations of this. Okay, so able to see exactly or make a mapping between what, what are the roles, what are the main hydrophobic contacts, what these guys are doing in comparison to this one here. So we could Give a presentation on why endoglucanases 3 have uh, evolved um, and has, a, has this built in feature. Uh, 
last topic, if you'll give me more, three more minutes. So the main problem in this whole business, well, not the main problem, one of the main problems, it's what it's known as uh, uh, cell wall recalcitrance. Uh, this is also from uh, Mike Himmel's uh, uh, review. Uh, you have cellulose, but cellulose is not alone. It's covered with hemicellulose and covered with lignin, and this makes the wood hard, right? Hard wood hard. Okay, so you have to remove hemicellulose, you have to remove lignin, that's fine. But the idea is, can you devise or genetically modify plants such that you change the composition of hemicellulose and still you have a viable plant, plant that is able to grow, but its, um, its biomass is less uh, resistance, resistant to enzyme attack. That's the, that's the question. You try to design, to understand molecular le cellular um, cell wall at a molecular level. So the idea is to understand how the composition of uh, hemicellulose uh, can change in order to how can you change hemicellulose? What are the main components? You take sugar cane, for instance. The hemicellulose composition is known. Which of these hemicellulose components can you remove and still uh, be able to get uh, a viable plant and yet reduce uh, cellulose recalcitrant? So for that, we have to build fibrils of cellulose. So we actually wrote a program. It's out there in the. Uh, it's free. You can. Uh, build um, any types of fibrils of cellulose, any, you can build planes of cellulose, crystalline cellulose, all the allomorph, not all the allomorph, but many of the allomorph uh, phases of uh, crystalline cellulose you can build. And uh, once you have uh, your subunits, you can actually use PACMAL that uh, the Andrew Martinez here is, uh, has has already talked or will talk about, um, that you can pack these things together. You can actually build large um, uh, fibrils. Okay, you, you can decorate this with hemicellulose. And so the idea is to change composition, get different hemicellulose types and compositions, and try to see how, what is the difference, the, or what is the process elementary fibrils. Uh, we could not do this yet with molecular simulations, but we adopted a different strategy with uh, Andrei's uh, um, help. Uh, we went back to uh, integral equations, the 3D uh, RISM, Kovalenko, Urata calculations. Many of you are too young to remember the, <laughs> the uh, integral equations, but this is one thing that we can do. We can build the fibrils and surround this by hemicellulose, different compositions of hemicellulose. And then you investigate, you change the composition of hemicellulose, you treat hemicellulose as a solvent, and you can do the following. Let's suppose you adopt this reaction coordinate here. You take apart two fibrils along hydrophilic contacts. Or this path here, you take apart cellulose microfibrils along by disrupting hydrophobic contacts. And you change the composition of the surrounding solvent. The surrounding solvent is water, hemicellulose of different types. And you can do this. And this is the free energy profile or potential admin force that you obtain along the, this, this different path. So you have direct cellulose, cellulose contact right here, and you have a solvent separated contact, solvent separated layer. So you have, it's like this, you have one layer of solvent in here, so the two cellulose separated there, and at infinity distance, you have completely dissociated. So you can do this for different types of, uh, of uh, hemicellulose types and 
concentration. And, and, and this is what we are doing now. We are also investigating how different types of cellulose, or even ionic liquids, actually solvate a fibril like this using uh, 3D uh, rhizom covalenco uh, data closure type of relations. All right, so to end, I, I, I'm way over five minutes, I have already over. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, my students, Erika Plates, Ivan Stankovic, Rodrigo Silveira, who did the, uh, many part of this work, Thiago Gomez for, uh, for the, for the um, cellulose builder. You can Google cellulose builder, you can uh, do that. Um, Leandro Martinez, uh, many long, long time uh, friend and collaborator, and uh, Igor Polikarpov, and you for your attention.